Well, how's everybody doing this morning? I hope you're doing okay. Anybody? You doing good? Uh, I'll be honest, man. Um, lessons in, in being observant, like I didn't even know there was a big old snowman in here until Daniel said that. And I turned around and said, sure enough, there's this massive giant snowman up in the house. <laughs> Merry Christmas, you know, it's coming. I told the team the other day, we're on the countdown and uh, Christmas will be here before you know. Are you ready? Have you shopped yet, anybody? I'm just playing. All right. Well, welcome to church. Hey, listen, last week, I just want to, I just want to thank you guys. Um, the whole team, the whole staff team was away last Sunday and man, I heard church was amazing. So we're going to take off a few more Sundays, but I heard church was awesome and God moved in powerful ways. And I, I'll tell you this, man, I'm um, just having four days together. Um, and in the presence of the Lord in that way, uh, just kind of letting everything else just kind of Put a, be put aside for a moment and just taking hours a day, hours a day to pursue Jesus and to be in the manifest glory of God. I'm saying a lot of big churchy words right now, but I'm telling you, I don't know, I don't know how else to explain it other than just sitting in the manifest glory of God it was so powerful, so life-giving. And um, just praying for the church and, and driving by um, Snyder here the other day uh, as we got home and just in my spirit praying and I felt like I heard the Lord said, I'm going to pour it out. And so can we pray into that? That God would just pour his presence out. Um, you know, it's funny because to worship him, we don't really need songs and we don't need sermons, right? We just need his presence. So can we just ask right now, would you just close your eyes and hold your hands out um, in a way of posture of, of surrender, but also in receiving, because here's the truth of the matter. We come to exalt Jesus. That's our past. I mean, that's our passion. That's our, that's our posture. But when the spirit of God rests on a, on a house, the way he does, the way only he can do, man, we end up receiving such a blessing from his presence. And so Jesus, would you just rest on us this morning? Would you rest on this room? As we declare, here we are to worship you. We're here to exalt you. Lord, we know that your nearness is our desire, but it's also our good. And so we thank you for your presence. We thank you that there's some healing you want to do. We thank you that there's some forgiveness that you want to pour out. We thank you that there's some hearts that are willing and ready to offer and receive forgiveness, but, but to give forgiveness to maybe even some in the house here to some family, we, we thank you that you want to do some restoring of marriages today, that you want to begin a process where reconciliation happens in homes, where families begin to unite, where the enemy has tried to divide. And we, we claim that, in fact, we prophesy that promise that God, you delight in unity. And so we just ask that your presence would rest on every home and bring unity. And Lord, we just bless you for the new friendships that are going to be made today, for connections that are going to be made today, for people plugging in and stepping into a new season today where they say, as for me and my house, we will serve and love and obey you. And, and um, Lord, just be the delight of our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Staying the Table Sunday, man. We're going to set the table today by talking a little bit about serving. We're going to wrap up our Navigating Nineveh series this morning. The past six weeks, we've been talking about this, where we've examined this guy Jonah and God's calling upon his life nearly every week around here. We say something like, and you've probably heard this before, but we say something like, you know, we believe that God is always inviting us to take that next step. He's always inviting us into another step, another spiritual step. And with that said, let me just say this. God is an orderly God. He is an intentional God. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's compassionate. He's kind. He's gentle. He's loving. He's good. But he's also very organized, very intentional. He's a God of order. There's not one thing that God does that does not have significant purpose to it, which is why Everything about God carries a weight to it. And, and we can't be flippant about that. We can't just kind of dismiss it as if, oh yeah, it was a great Sunday. Oh, how was worship? It was a great Sunday. We sang my favorite song. It was so, no, no, no. <laughs> we can't be flippant about that, man. In the presence of God, he is a God of order and he's so intentional. Um, and, and with that intentionality, I want you to know that this includes you and me. Um, much like Jonah, it includes you and me. You and I have divine purpose. In fact, we say this also a lot. 
you were created on purpose for purpose. And I'm going to just tell you, man, one of the coolest things that I've been able to be a part of that I did not anticipate how cool this would be when we decided to say yes to Jesus and and we're going to launch this church was watching so many of you say yes to Jesus as well. Um, In fact, uh, thinking back just a little over eight years ago now when we said yes and we started moving towards a launch, can I just say this? Um, There are some in this house that for eight years have been saying yes. Come on, somebody. Can we honor that? In fact, when we do church planting, um, we go to these conferences where they train and they, they talk about all these things. And they said this statistic that really bothered me. And it bothered me because I love people. It bothered me because I don't want to see that statistic take place. But the statistic that they would say to us was, hey, pastor, be warned because your first 100 will not be your first 300 and your first 300 will not be your first 500. And that really bothered me to the core. It made me feel like, well, that means people are going to come and they're going to plug in and they're going to step out. And I didn't like that. And, and so I began to pray about that. And can I tell you something? Um, at Declaration, that statistic, while we've seen some come and some go, that statistic has been completely annihilated because there is many that still show up at 6 a.m. on Sunday morning that were here on day one when the trailers first pulled in the parking lot and they were here this morning still setting up for church, setting the table. Come on, isn't that amazing? Eight years nearly, eight years. Now listen, there's some of you Um, maybe you have been plugged in for about eight days and that's okay. We got many years to go. Come on, right? (laughs) We've only been doing this for eight minutes this morning. That's okay. God's going to speak and he's going to do incredible things. And and I want to do this. Can we watch this quick video and just celebrate when, when we say yes to God, watch this video. Okay. When I say yes, I get up early on Sunday. When I say yes, I pick up a trailer and bring it to church for setup. When I say yes, I wake up my boys early on Sunday. When I say yes, I help to set up for others to enjoy church. When I say yes, it means I pray for the children throughout the week. When I say yes, it means I show up every Sunday morning with a smile on my face. When I say yes, it means I take personal time to prepare for Sunday mornings. When I say yes, I have to commit more time to church on Sunday. When I say yes, I have to try to think like a third or fourth grader. When I say yes, I need extra patience when things don't go as I had hoped. When I said yes, it means my family making room on our Saturdays for our small group. When I said yes, it means opening up my home for others. When I said yes, it means taking time to plan out our small group. When I say yes, it means taking time to pray for the moms and daughters. Because I said yes, I have a great community of believers that I can count on. Because I said yes, I'm able to teach my boys about being the hands and feet of Jesus. Because I said yes, I'm able to glorify God with my actions and be part of the church. Because I said yes, I get to see kids understand why God's relationship is important. Because I said yes, I'm being obedient to God's calling. Because I said yes, I get to see God working in the lives of His children. Because I said yes, I am meeting other moms of preteens and teens. Because I said yes, my daughter is making new friends. Because I said yes, I get to see moms and daughters form stronger bonds. I said yes. I say yes. I said 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 yes. 
I said yes. I said yes. I said yes. I said yes. I said yes. I said yes. I said yes. I said yes. I said yes. I said yes. I said yes. Love it. So we were created on purpose for purpose. And like Jonah, God created and calls each of us to a life of purpose. A life of purpose. The great news with this is that our lives can be filled and fulfilled with intentionality and incredibly deep meaning. And let me just ask you this. Who doesn't want to live a life of meaning, right? We want to live a life of meaning. Now, where we get in trouble is... Um, where we challenge our ability to live into our, our value and our meaning is when we decide to go at it on our own. Um, when we decide that we have a better plan and a better destiny for ourselves other than the destiny that God has for us. When we, when we kind of um, decide that we have a different purpose for ourselves other than the purposes that God has created us for. So we go our own way, much like Jonah. We may not think of ourselves as necessarily rebellious. We may not think of ourselves as necessarily disobedient as Jonah. But make no mistake, when God calls us to something, because he's an intentional God of order... If we don't respond with our best yes, then we're going the way of Jonah. Choosing our own desires, choosing our own destiny, forsaking our created purpose for some co-opted purpose, right? So the question that we have to ask ourselves this morning is this, how's it going to end? How's the story going to end? Now you may be thinking, well, pastor, we ended the, the book like two weeks ago. But how's the story going to end? And I think... You'll understand a little bit more of that question by the end of the message this morning. How's the story going to end? As we open the book of Jonah briefly, week by week, here's what we've seen. We're going to go fast. Week one, we saw this, that disobedience to God will cause distance from God. The disobedience to God will cause a disengagement, if you will, from the things and the people that God loves. So distance personally, a disengagement, if you will. Here's good metrics for us just to kind of get a, a self-check here, a litmus test. Um, disobedience to God will cause a delay into living into all that God created us to live into. In week two, we saw how disobedience can cause indifference. Our heart begins to grow callous. We just don't care anymore. We think that everything else becomes more important. We live life based on convenience and comfort and things like this. We, we are indifferent to the needs of people. We are indifferent different to the needs around us. In fact, the things that used to break our heart don't seemingly move us as much as they used to any longer. And we're moved by other things. We find ourselves bowing at other altars to lesser gods. And we give our affections and our attention and our allegiance to things that just don't do it. We become indifferent. Disobedience can lead to potential destruction, not just for our lives, but potentially our decisions and our disobedience can, can lead to destruction in the lives of others. Our children, future generations, the seeds that we plant today will bear fruit in some form at some time. Will we like the fruit that we see two or three orchards from now? And so when we're disobedient, it causes all sorts of potential chaos. In week three, we saw some good news and that God does make a way for reconciliation, that God does listen to us when we pray and that God can and will deliver us from our potential destruction, which led to week four, where hopefully we saw that God is far more holy than we think him to be. He is far more worthy. He is far more powerful. He is far more just. He is far more beautiful, outstandingly unbelievable, unfathomable are his ways. And it, it, sometimes it takes us just to get completely knocked down. It takes that deep valley experience. It takes that dark night of the soul. Sometimes it's a mountaintop moment where the manifest kabod weight of glory rests upon you and you recognize it. And you're like, man, I've gone so far. I've become so indifferent. I've become so disengaged. But man, he's so much more holy than we thought. But here's the good part too. He's so much more merciful than we think. In week five, we realize that when we choose to live in disobedience to God like Jonah, we'll begin to question the heart of God. We'll begin to oppose and abdicate the love of God. Um, we'll isolate ourselves from community. We'll begin to use excuses like, well, I can be a Christian, but I don't have to be a part of the church. That's like me saying, I'm going to be married to Keller, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not ever going to go home. How long is that going to last? 
It's a convenient, watch this, it's a convenient cultural construct for us to continue to choose our flesh and to hold our offense, but it's not dying to self and living for Christ. It's not carrying a cross. So we question God's heart, we abdicate God's love, we isolate from community, which can lead us to have this need for justice, our justice. And in order to achieve our justice, we end up justifying our sinfulness. And this could all cost us living under the riches of God's full blessing. See, we won't live the fulfilled, purpose-filled, meaningful life that God created us and called us to live. Our lives won't enjoy this depth of meaning that God created us to have. Of course, of course, we always have deep value to God and to others, but when we choose to live in disobedience to God's calling and to God's created intentional order to his purposes in and for our lives, we will not live in the fullness of abundance that he not only created us for, but he died to secure for us. We just say, no, God, it's okay. I'd rather go do this instead. So last week, Pastor Dave did such a great job. I hope if you were here, did you enjoy Pastor Dave? He's he's a good friend and he's buff. So I feel like he's my bodyguard sometimes. The pastor did such a great job challenging us to be obedient to God through things like our enthusiasm that we would that we would love God in such a way that we would be excited about the things of God, the heart of God, what God is doing, what God is calling us to, that we would be engaged with God, that there would be an engagement, being on co-mission, being that ministerial mission, that there would be this expectation of great things because God is involved, right? And God only does great things. And so why wouldn't we have expectation? Even in the waiting, we continue to still expect. Man, I was fired up listening to Dave's message last week. And I hope you were too. See, our prayer is that, that, that we've been encountering God in such a way that we find ourselves in this place where we just can't help ourselves anymore. We're not going to be the same. We can't, continue, um, we can't continue in this spiritual apathy, if you will, this, this, this lazy lethargy spiritually. We can't continue to just sleep our way through these moments when I believe that God is calling us to wake up and to get up and to go. Because listen, if there's one major takeaway that we can see from the story that we've been studying, it's this. God is passionate for people. I like to say it to students like this. God is cuckoo for cocoa puffs over people. He is. It doesn't matter how lost they may seem to be. It doesn't matter how far they may have gone. It doesn't matter how broken we may even think they are. God loves every person that he has created. He has a plan for every person he has created. He desires to see every person he created redeemed. He's got a passion for people. Listen, here's the interesting thing this morning as we wrap this Navigating Your Nineveh series. Here's what I hope to see today. The story of Jonah, we've done... Five weeks now, kind of living in. Um, Six weeks. The story of Jonah really isn't even about Jonah at all. Did you know that? It's really not even about Jonah. If you really look at the story, see, we might think, oh, no, 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 it is. It's about that dude in the whale, right? No, 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 listen. No, pastor, it is about, it's about Jonah's rebellion. It's about his need for redemption. It's about um, Nineveh's repentance and, and Jonah's response to Nineveh's repentance. Yeah, we've seen all that stuff, but the story about Jonah is really not about us knowing more about or seeing Jonah as much as it's about us seeing Jesus through Jonah. The story of Jonah is about the very heart of God. I hope you haven't missed that. It's about the heart of God. It's God's story with Jonah as a character in it. Now remember, we're not the point of the story. We say this a lot. We're not the point of the story. We are a very important part of his story. And as we study Jonah's story, more than seeing Jonah, I hope that it's pointing us to see Jesus. The story of Jonah is about the very heart of God. It's where we see and it's where we learn that God is absolutely passionate about all people. Our God possesses, listen to me, he possesses this white hot passion for every person, especially those that do not know him yet. He desires for all the people of the world, even those who are wicked and far from him, even those who reject him, even politicians. Hello. God desires. 
I'm just playing. He, if you're a politician, I love you if you're here. I'm just playing with you. It's like, you know, lawyer jokes are old, so we're moving to politicians. God desires to redeem every person. That's his desire. But watch this. With that, he desires to use us in his intentional, created, ordered process. He wants to use you, and he wants to use me. Charles Spurgeon once said this. He said, the life of Jonah cannot be written without God. Take God out of the prophet's history, and there is no history to write. Can I say this? You could just interject my name where Jonah is. is. You could interject your name where Jonah is. See, we're an important part of the story. We're not the point of the story. God is the point of the story. And God is painting his self-image day by day on the tapestry of our lives. And it's, it's so much easier and so much faster and so much better and so much more beautiful when we allow that, when we cooperate. See, here's another way to look at some of the takeaways from Jonah's life, chapter by chapter. In chapter one, Jonah learned the lesson of God's providence and God's patience in this. You can't run away from God. In chapter two, Jonah learned the lesson of God's pardon and that God forgives those who will call upon him. See, Jonah called upon the Lord and he realized forgiveness and freedom. I called the Lord and he heard and he answered from the depths of the ocean in the belly of a beast. I called the Lord and he heard and he answered. Can I tell you something, friend? Listen to me. I don't care how far you think you've run. Maybe you find yourself in the depth of the ocean in the belly of the beast. You call upon the name of the Lord and he will hear you and he will answer you. He is faithful. He is passionate about you. So Jonah learns about God's pardon. Chapter 3, he learns the lesson about God's power as he saw this whole city humble itself before the mighty hand of God. See, God's message through Jonah was just a few words long. He didn't get 35 minutes. Some of you are like, you on the clock, dude. His message was not very long. I know somebody right now, so if you're, if you're like me, you're probably a student, you're thinking, well, dude, if he only had like six or seven words, what's your problem, dude, right? Like, he was very effective. <laughs> he didn't give any commentary. Listen to me. He didn't quote any great theologians of old. He didn't break it down into the Greek and the Hebrew and impress anybody with his knowledge of the Aramaic. <laughs> He literally just gave the words. He said a very, just a very, very few empowered words of God. And literally it changed the whole city. In chapter 4, Jonah had to learn the lesson of God's pity. And that God has compassion for lost sinners like the Ninevites. God has compassion for terrible people like these Assyrians that live in Nineveh. People that Jonah did not like. In fact, people that Jonah detested, God loved. And so Jonah had to learn about God's pity and God's compassion. That God desired that his servants also have pity and compassion. So much so that they would love as God loves. Jonah has to learn about God's pity. And though Jonah had witnessed the mercy of God for himself, and though Jonah had, ex he had encountered the forgiveness of God for himself, it must not have been enough for him to translate that to others as we saw in chapter 4. He was still complaining. He was still grumbling. It seems incredible to me that God, through Jonah, brought a whole city to faith in the Lord. And he's missing it by a mile. He's missing it by a mile. Though Jonah is being used by God in supernatural measure, and he's seeing it happen, though Jonah begrudgingly obeys God's command, and he sees literal revival take place, somehow Jonah failed to love the people that he was preaching to. Somehow, Jonah did not learn to love the very people that God loved, that God called him to, even in the process. Let me ask this question this morning. Do we love the people that we are called to preach to? Do we love the people that we are called to preach to? Enough to sacrifice a Sunday morning of sports? Enough to forego that next thing that we want to do because God is calling us to sow into something of eternal value? Enough to care in the cash register line when you look in the eyes across at the person who's scanning the grocery and you see complete hollow, dark lostness 
and you keep going? Do we love the people that we're called to preach to? Maybe we need to consider it this way. What will it take for us to begin to care about people's spiritual realities more than our physical realities, more than our physical idolatries? What will it take? When, how, or what will it take for us to become so consumed with a passion and a gratitude for Jesus, so much so that we just can't help ourselves anymore? We become so consumed with this passion for the presence of God, for the glory of God, for the things of God, we, we become passionate about the people that God loves and we become passionate about God's calling upon our lives, about the fact that he's created us and he's called us to a life of fulfilled, abundant meaning and purpose and everything else pales in comparison. What is it going to take? When is that going to, like, if not now, then when? If we can't look back and measure the mountain of blessing and see the favor and the hand of God and be moved to say yes with our best yes, then what will it take? See, in seeing that in the story of Jonah, it's not so much about Jonah, but more so it's about Jesus or the heart of God. I want to look at something Jesus said, because as I said in the beginning of the series, Jonah is the only prophet that Jesus likens himself to. He evokes Jonah's name. So go to Matthew chapter 12 with me. We're going to start in verse 38. If you've got your Bible, if you don't have a Bible, we have some free ones for you um, at, the, at the Hospitality Information Connection Communication Center. I don't know what it's called. It's that desk out there. It's one of them. The good news is, is there's a lot of tables. The Bibles are hidden. Where's Waldo? Go find them. I'm just playing. Go look at all the tables. But there's this exchange that's taking place between Jesus and some religious leaders in Matthew 12. Look at it, verse 38. Some of the scribes and Pharisees say to Jesus, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. You know what they're saying? They're saying, hey, teacher, we want to see you perform a confirming miracle Basically, so to reveal to us that who you are is really who you say you are. Confirm yourself with a sign, with a miracle. But Jesus answers and says, an evil and adulterous generation craves the confirming miracles. See, it's an evil and adulterous generation who has to see it to believe it. And so no sign will be given to it, Jesus says, except, and here's what he says, except for the sign of Jonah, the prophet. For just as Jonah was in the stomach of the sea monster for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And then he says, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn this generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. See, as bad as the people of Nineveh were, it's a, Jesus says they are going to stand against this generation at the judgment because the people of Nineveh didn't have to have the confirming sign. They didn't have to see it to believe it. They heard the message. They believed. They repented. They were redeemed simply by responding in faith to the preaching of Jonah the prophet. But now Jesus says, but something greater than Jonah is here. He's saying, I am your confirming miracle. I'm standing right in front of you, yet you ask me for more signs. And how many times have we been guilty of this? God, if you're really good, then you'll. God, if you're God, then I need you to. How many times have we... Look, we have Jesus, we have the word, we know what Jesus has done for us. We've seen the hand and the favor and the blessing of God over and over and over and over again. For whatever reason, we can't trust him now. I mean, so we ask for a sign. We ask for another sign, sign after sign, a confirming sign. The Ninevites had no sign, just a word from the Lord, yet they believe. The religious leaders who should have known better, they're craving a sign with Jesus standing right there in front of them, yet they're still challenged to believe. What does this say about religion? What does this say about some religious leaders? I'll tell you what it says. Listen, you can be religious and lack faith. You can be a good moral person and miss heaven by miles. You can do all the Bible studies. You can quote all the scriptures. You know what? The demons know the scriptures. Give us a confirming sign. 
Step one, Jonah, believe. Step one, believe. Do, do the actions and the activities of our lives declare that we truly believe in the Jesus that we profess, the one that we say that we love, the one that we worship? Step one, believe in who he is. Step two, be obedient to what he says. Jonah, go to Nineveh. Jonah, go be willing to give your life, to risk your life, to give your life if need be. Go be willing for the sake of the gospel and getting the gospel to these people. Go be willing, Jonah. Go to Nineveh. Step two, go to Nineveh. Step one, Jonah, do you believe? Do you believe me? Answer, obviously, yes. We see in 2 Kings, uh, I think chapter 14, um, we see this, this, this thing take place where Jonah had gone to speak to the people of God about a situation and, and things happen. So does Jonah believe? Yes. Step two, Jonah, this one's harder. This is not, this will not require you going to the people of God. This will not require you going to the people you know. This will not re require you going to the people that you love, that the ones that you belong to. This step requires you to go to the tribe you don't know. This step requires you to go to the tribe you don't necessarily like. This step requires you to go in faith. Step two, and it's going to be uncomfortable for you, Jonah. It's going to cost you, Jonah. It's going to make you have to sacrifice time, Jonah. It might make you sacrifice income over here because you're going to go over there, Jonah. It's going to be, it, it could be very undesirable, undesirable completely for you. And it's going to, it's going to be uncomfortable, but it's, it's, it's incredibly necessary, Jonah, for them if you go. Step two, Jonah, go to Nineveh. Be obedient to what I'm asking you to do. Give me your best yes, Jonah. Step two, go to Nineveh. I've got purpose in this, Jonah. You may not see it. You may not understand it. I don't need you to understand, Jonah. I just need you to move in faith. One day you will understand. I've got purpose for you, and I've got purpose for them. I've got a plan. Jonah's response, i got to run. <laughs> i got to get out of here. No, God, is what Jonah says. No. I'll take a, a, a one way to Tarshish. I hear there's really nice beaches there with good little coconut flowery drinks with straws. Takes me further than I want to go, keeps me longer than I want to stay, makes me co it costs way more than I want to pay, but I'll take Tarshish. I'm getting as far away from that as I possibly can. I, I'm going to run from your presence as futile as that is. With all this says, even still... I want to show you something with, with all that that we've seen and heard and studied. I want to show you something remarkable. Um, I want to show you <laughs> something in this story about Jonah and Jesus. See, I want us to see how their stories make them very similar in many, many, many ways, yet also completely different at the same time. First things first, how were they similar? Listen, we see that both Jonah and Jesus were from Galilee, both of them. We saw that in 2 Kings 14. We saw that both sent, they were both first sent to God's people, Israel, and then to the Gentiles. We saw that. We saw that both were willing to die for people. Jonah, sort of begrudgingly, but was willing to die for the sailors if it meant the storm would stop and they'd be okay. He said, throw me overboard. And then obviously we know Jesus. Both Jonah and Jesus preached and the Jews first refused, yet the Gentiles accepted both Jonah and Jesus went to sleep in a boat. Come on, everybody know that? Both Jonah and Jesus were accused of not caring while sleeping in the storm. Remember when the captain comes down and says, hey, get up, dude, what are you doing? Why don't you come do like all the other sailors are doing? Pray to your God, maybe your God will do something. Jesus is asleep, the disciples wake him up. Don't you care that there's a storm outside? Both Jonah and Jesus. Both were sequestered for three days and three nights. Do you see the similarities here? See, in many ways, the story of Jonah foreshadows the redemptive work that Jesus could come to do. The story of Jonah is not about Jonah at all. It just so happens that so many things in Jonah's life is looking like and pointing to somebody greater. According to Jonah 1.1 1, 1 and Jonah 3, 1 through 2, 
Jonah's mission was to call the broken, messed up, sinful Assyrian people of Nineveh to repent and to acknowledge Yahweh as the source of salvation. According to Matthew chapter 28, Jesus' mission was to call all of mankind, including Gentiles, to repent and acknowledge him to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. According to Jonah chapter 1, verse 12, as just as I kind of said a second ago, Jonah was willing to sacrifice his life for the salvation of these unknown new friends, these sailors, while according to Matthew 20, Mark 10, and John 1, 1 Timothy, Jesus is willing to sacrifice his life for the salvation of the world. According to Jonah chapter 2, verse 1, Jonah, not dead, but definitely disobedient, is entombed, if you will, in the belly of a whale, sure to meet a fate there. While according to Matthew 27, Mark 6, Luke 23, after Jesus' death, he's placed in Joseph's tomb. Jonah being a picture of being disobedient in a storm, having to be thrown overboard in order to calm the seas, then swallowed. Jesus, different than Jonah, being a picture of being completely obedient, even in a storm, letting us know that through him, that we can actually walk on water with the faith. That we can have complete peace no matter the storm. That we can have authority in the midst of whatever storm may come. According to Jonah 2.11 on the third day, Jonah was resurrected, so to say, from this belly of a fish, spit out, vomited, puked. That should have been a fun day. Not enough soap or stick-ups alive, y'all. While according to Matthew 17, Matthew 20, Matthew 28, Mark 9, Mark 10, Mark 16, Luke 9, Luke 24, Luke 25. Listen, on the third day, it says, Jesus is resurrected from the grave. Similar, 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 similar. After Jonah's resurrection from the belly of a whale in obedience to his mission, he goes, um, on, he answers the call to the Gentile Assyrians to repentance and salvation. We see this in Jonah chapter three, verses one through three. After Jesus' resurrection from the tomb, he continues his mission that he had already began to launch the universal church, to build his kingdom, to commission um, the apostles, so to spread the gospel to every nation on the earth. We see this in Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, Luke chapter 24, and Acts chapter 1. According to Jonah 3, 4, Jonah, after his resurrection of sorts, went to preach and prophesy that Nineveh would be destroyed in 40 days if her people did not repent. While somewhat differently, according to Acts 1, 3, Jesus, after post-resurrection, preaches and teaches the new covenant church for 40 days before his ascension. Do you see it? Similarity after similarity after similarity after the story of Jonah is not really about Jonah, y'all. It's pointing to something greater. Yeah, his life in a lot of ways may have looked like Jesus. And lastly, most beautifully, as we see in Jonah 1 and Jonah 3 and Jonah, um, well, two parts in Jonah 3, nine, verses 9 and 10 and 4 and 5. Jonah taught... That failure to repent of sin would bring judgment, but salvation is a gift of God. And of course, if we were to look at Matthew um, uh, chapter 5, John chapter 5, John chapter 8, John, or Luke chapter 24, John chapter 3, hello, 16 and 17, John 5, John 10, Acts chapter 2, we see that Jesus also taught that failure to repent of sin brings judgment, but salvation is a gift of God. Similarity after similarity after similarity. The story of Jonah is not really about Jonah at all. He's a part of the story. He's just not the point of the story. Jonah's life looks a lot like Jesus in so many ways. See, his story illustrates and highlights and prophesies or foreshadows something greater in Jesus. This is why I say it's not really about Jonah. It's really about the heart of God. It points to a greater story. So with all the similarities that we can see in Jonah and Jesus, now let's look at just a few key differences. Some I've already kind of pointed out, but the two that I wanted to hone in on are simply this. It was never a question. Listen, number one, Jesus was always willing to be obedient to God. Always. The band can come. I want you to think, even as he anguished in the garden of Matthew chapter 26, knowing that the cross was imminent, even as he was saying, God, I trust that you're a God of order. God, I believe, Father, that you're so intentional. God, if there's any other way, can we please have plan B? But three different times. But God, Father, 
Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. See, Jesus was always willing to be obedient to God. Jonah, not so much. But Jesus was always willing to be obedient to God's call. Number two, Jesus being completely obedient to God at all times because of his love for God and God's people, he chose to say yes. Because of Jesus' love for his Father and his love for the things that his Father loved, he was willing to give his best yes, no questions asked. See, Jonah, he came choosing judgment over mercy, but someone better testify today because Jesus came so mercy could triumph over judgment. See, they look a lot of, they, there's so many similarities, but there are some, there's just a few really stark differences. Jonah preached the message of judgment, but Jesus preached a message of grace and salvation according to John 3. John, 1 John 2, Jonah almost died for his sins, but Jesus willingly died for the sins of the world. Jonah 4, 1 John 4, Jonah's ministry was just, just to one city, really. That's what he's known for, but Jesus, his ministry is to the entire planet. John 8, Jonah's obedience was not from the heart. We saw it in chapter 4 in vivid technicolor. But Jesus always did whatever pleased the Father. Romans 5, listen, Jonah didn't love the people that he came to save, but Jesus had compassion for sinners and proved his love by dying for them on the cross, willingly saying, I'm giving you my best yes, no matter what it may cost. It's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. It doesn't look like it's hip to the culture. On the cross, here's the best, outside the city. Remember that? Jonah takes himself outside the city to look, watch. On the cross outside the city, Jesus asks the Father to forgive those who are murdering him in Luke 23. But Jonah waits outside the city to see if God would kill those that he would not forgive. Listen, man, we got to know this. We got to see it in our context. God was so willing to spare Nineveh, but in order to do that, he would not spare his own son. Someone would have to die for their sins or they would die in their sin. Jonah hated them because of their sin. And in no way could he see a context where he would be willing to go and risk or give his life for theirs. But Jesus came to give his life because of the sin of the world. No matter what it would cost him, Jesus gave his best yes for us. Come on, somebody. And listen, listen. God loved Nineveh. He is passionate about people. He loved them. He loved them. He, God, man, God loves hurting people. God loves broken people. God loves damaged people, sick people, sinful people, morally good people, and even debaucherous and promiscuous people. God loves them all. Romans 8 tells us that he, he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for every single one of us. How will we not also along with him graciously give up everything? How? When's it going to happen? What's it going to take for us to move off our little comfortable high horse? For us to move out of our little convenient zip code, if it means that. To get out of our house. To say no to those things that may look good, but it's not what God's asking us. What's it going to take? See, Jesus, he used Jonah's ministry to Nineveh to illustrate to the Jews how guilty they were in rejecting him. Remember what he said in Matthew 12 as he's having that dialogue? He said, the men of Nineveh, those that Jonah despised, man, they're going to rise in judgment against you. Against your generation. They're going to condemn you because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something and someone so much greater than Jonah is standing right in front of you. See, Jonah's story points to something greater. Here's the question. I told you you'd understand at the end. What about our story? How's our story going to end? How's it going to end? Is our story all and only about us? 
our job, our kids, our hobbies, our education, our 401k, our paycheck, our offense, our anger, our hurt, our trauma, our entitlements. Or is our, is our story pointing to something and someone greater? How do we navigate our Nineveh? Number one, love God. This is where it gets really deep, y'all. You ready? Love God. Love God fully, fervently, faithfully. Understand who God is. Understand what God has done. Understand, see what God is doing. Understand what he is inviting us to be a part of. Love God, his story, meaning, purpose. Love God. Number two, be obedient to God. It's getting deeper. <laughs> be obedient to God. Out of this deep love for God, be obedient. Again, faithfully, fully, fervently, be obedient no matter what. Serve God out of this deeply grateful heart give him your best yes be obedient to God number three love what God loves including who God loves out of us obedience to God because of our grateful love for God we choose to serve you God we choose to love the things you love we choose to despise the things you despise those things that are keeping us from you we don't want those things which in turn means if we love God and if we love the things God loves we're going to love and serve the people that God loves and came to serve and came to seek and came to save do we love the people that we are called to preach to see this is how we set the table we set it the table Sunday no big updates because as we've been saying from the beginning it's not about a building it's about building the kingdom of God it's about building people who love God it's about building a, 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 an atmosphere of faith an environment if you will where people will enter into the room and because of the purity and because of the holiness and because of the passion and the desperation and the crying out to God the spirit of God just loves that house descends on that house and people can't walk in the door without chains falling off and addictions being broken and lives being saved and marriages being healed things changing we love the people we're called to. It's how we set the table. By giving God our best, yes. By doing what God asks when he calls us, we say yes, not halfway, all in. Not only when it's convenient, not only when it's comfortable, not only when it caters to our wants and our needs and our whims and our desires. When we say yes to God, we die to self. And with our whole hearts, we declare him at the center. We love God. We serve God. We love people. We serve people. All people. We exist to help people encounter Him and follow Jesus. How? Well, why? Because your life is a confirming sign of the miraculous nature and character of who God is. See, first and foremost, it's way more than our church vision, man. This should be the vision of our life. Why? Because it was what Jesus came for and what He died for that people could encounter Him and begin to serve and follow Him. So, How's it going to end? We saw how Jonah ended. But how will our story end? What will we do with the remaining minutes and hours and seconds and days and years that God is giving us? We don't want to make the same mistake Jonah made. Let me say it like this. There's so many areas of our lives that look a lot like Jesus. What ways do we need to, we don't look like Jesus at all? Humbly obedient to the call and the command of God, no matter what. We don't want to just have similarities to Jesus. We want to be like Jesus, especially in our fervent love for God, especially in our obedience to God, our faithful to be, especially in how we love and serve those that God loves and came to serve. Are we passionate about the things that God is passionate about? So much so that we are willing to die to our personal realities and our idolatries so to be consumed with this passion for the things that God loves. Would you pray with me? Would you stand and pray with me this morning? Do you love the people that you're called to preach to? 
Are you willing to declare today, as for me and my house, we will serve you, glorify you? Are you willing to declare today, let it be in my house that we will love you and obey you wholeheartedly, completely, Jesus? Are you willing to declare today that he's the first and the only, that he's the King of kings and Lord of lords, that he is truly holy, that only he is truly worthy, worthy of our lives, worthy of our worship, worthy of our attention, worthy of our affection, worthy of our alignment, worthy of our allegiance. That when we hear him call our name, we say yes, and it's our best yes, because we're dying to self. We're giving him our whole heart, our total obedience. This hit me before we started this morning. God is most fully glorified when we are most fully obedient to God. So today, the team is about to sing. We're just going to sing that little chorus. As for me and and my house, I'm going to give you an opportunity just to pray. If you are here and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, right now is your moment. Just say, Jesus, I surrender. I want to be completely obedient to you in my whole life. Just pray that right now. I surrender. I want to be obedient with my whole life. Empty me of myself, Jesus. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for saving me. Maybe you're here. And God is calling you to repentance today. He wants to forgive you. No matter how far you've run. Jonah, listen to me. Turn around. He's right there. We have prayer partners on the long the black curtain to your right if you need to pray. If you'd like to come to the table of the Lord this morning, we have two response tables in the front and some in the back. There's elements there for communion and Eucharist. You can do that. But it's a tangible way a tangible expression of our obedience to God and out of our love for God because Jesus gave his best yes we're going to give you an opportunity to give your best yes begin to live into some purpose for kingdom look at those tables find a place to plug in and serve let's sing this before we go come on let's sing come on sing it this house sing it out Thank you so much for checking us out online today. If you need to make a decision about the next steps in your faith journey with Jesus, text CONNECT to 43000. And if you took the first step in your faith journey today by saying yes to Jesus, we want to know about it and we want to walk with you. So text JESUS to 43000. There you will find some resources and a message from Pastor John. There are so many ways to connect to Declaration. Check out declaration.org to find out more about who we are. Before we go, let's say our declaration together. Because of what the gospel has done in and to us, our lives exist to help people encounter and follow Jesus. We will devote ourselves to his word, his presence, and his people. We desire authenticity, intimacy, a heart of service, and to see his kingdom come. We are for Jesus and for people. Hey, have a great week. We're so glad you joined us. Bye for now.